Welcome to the Medical Menemist Podcast, your source for memory techniques and accelerated learning in higher education. Now, here's your host, Chase DeMarco. Today, we are joined by Dr. Shay Dada, who's currently the Director of Concussion and Neurocognition at New York University, Langone. She's presented at several National Society meetings and received numerous awards for her research in brain trauma. Her research interests include the gut-brain axis and brain glymphatic systems. She is also the Chief Executive Officer at Residency Success and is joining us today to discuss how to increase our cognition and study success through proper brain health. How are you doing, Shay? I'm doing great. Thank you so much, Dr. Marco, Chase, whatever you prefer to be called. I'd like to keep it casual. Chase is fine. (laughs) I really appreciate you having me on here. This is actually a really great opportunity for us to sort of join forces, like superpowers almost, (laughs) talk a little bit about how we can benefit students or future doctors or future medical providers or anyone really studying or anyone just looking to better their memory. It doesn't even have to be students. Even lay people, I feel that it's a big thing with the whole dementia and issue with memory loss later in life. I think the more we can do in terms of prevention and education now, it can benefit us. Yeah, so this topic is going to be very generalizable to pre-med, med student, residency. It doesn't really matter because your brain health and your ability to, to learn and be a lifelong learner is always important. So the ways that we can maximize our abilities to learn and have a healthier brain is going to be relevant for everyone. Exactly. So a brief introduction about you. I know you went to the same medical school as I do, which is a small little school in the Caribbean. I don't know if we should say the name or not. Up to you. Yeah, actually, we both went to school in the Netherlands Antilles, which was charming islands (laughs) off the coast of Venezuela, although we were on two different islands. And med school life was simple. I liked the simplicity of the island where I was just focusing on studying. I didn't have to worry about anything except my bill for my rent and my car. I studied. I came home. Of course, we were in paradise, so people were a little bit jealous, but I'm not much of a beach bum, so it was lost on me a little bit. I'm a city person. I came from the middle of Manhattan into an island, so I was a little bit like Tom Hanks in that movie, (laughs) feeling a little beach. (laughs) But I feel that overall, it was a good experience because it just allowed me to focus and I had less distractions at the time. That's always good. Less distractions while studying, very useful. And some of your past history has kind of led you into wishing to help resident students a little bit more, which is why you created Residency Success, correct? That's correct. I feel like at the time that I was studying, there wasn't anything out there, especially free in terms of podcasts or YouTube or blogs where I can actually read people's experiences and get some advice from people who had been through it. Being a foreign medical grad, it's much more difficult. It's like climbing a different mountain. Um, it's already like climbing a mountain to be a physician, but this is climbing like a couple of Mount Everest, you know, to get to where you have to go. and the challenges that presented to me, I really didn't have the proper guidance or mentors to get lead me through it. I feel like a lot of us, whether we have podcasts or in books or started organizations, was because we felt that gap, there was a lack of either proper guidance or proper mentorship or information. And that's why we go on to create these things to make it easier for the future generation to fill those gaps in the current education system. I love it. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So I guess we can get into right now some of the the trainings we usually recommend for students are for past guests have been involving memory techniques and study techniques. And now we're actually going to do something that I would consider more the preparatory stage. It's something you need to do on a daily basis to maximize your cognition and make sure that the other techniques you've learned in different episodes are actually going to be working efficiently. So what are some of those that we can discuss in the episode here. Oh, thanks for asking me that. So we'll kind of do broad strokes, but my interest in memory, it was purely selfish. When I was a medical student, you know, as a future neurologist at the time, I'm a neurologist now, I wanted the best and the most effective ways to study for my tests in order to do well. We will talk anatomy. We will talk about nutrition, talk about sleep hacks, sleep techniques, and why it's important for us to have proper light during the day and then 
have no light at a certain amount of time for us to get restful sleep. We'll also talk about meditation and we'll talk about basically evidence-based support for all of the things that we'll discuss. This is going to coincide so well with the materials we usually cover, which is more on the education side, the learning side. And now we're getting into more of the, the physiology and anatomy of it. And I think it's going to coincide very well. All right. Well, Chase, as we talk anatomy, the main parts of the brain involved in memory, we know are the amygdala, the hippocampus, the cerebellum, and the prefrontal cortex. The amygdala is mainly involved in fear and fear memories. The hippocampus looks like two little sort of Forces, I guess, is associated with declarative and episodic memory as well as recognition memory. And we'll talk more about that later. So basically, brain health and studying, for me, first thing is really taking stock of your mind and body connection. You really have to see, am I in the right mental space to be studying currently? If you have sort of an emergency or a family health emergency, or like a pressing matter that needs to be taken care of so you can focus, I think you should do that first. Minimizing distractions, quieting your mind, focusing on a single task is better than multitasking. As we know, studies have shown that now. Yep, task switching, something that we always do and feel like we're succeeding and getting multiple things done, but really that lack of efficiency, that the time switching from task to task has been shown time and time again to be detrimental. So we need to get out of those bad habits. To my horror, when I multitask, and I can do it pretty well, when I check my emails, there's usually a really frightening word that I've put in that should not have been there or a misspelling that I usually kind of beat myself up over, which could have been avoided if I was just a little bit more (laughs) present at the time. Sorry, I missed that. I was checking my phone while you were talking and I couldn't, you know. (laughs) It's in point, Chase. (laughs) So basically, there's also now, because... With the memory, we're always trying to see what can sharpen memory, right? And I'm really a big proponent of things that we can do ourselves as opposed to outsourcing it. People always thought, oh, let me get a tutor. Or let's say just study, not study tactics. They failed to see that the problem was with their tactics and their approach to the whole study matter as opposed to what they were actually doing, right? Maybe there wasn't a problem with how much time they were focusing. The problem was what they were doing outside of that. So one example is meditation. So with meditation and memory, there's a doctor at University of California, David Ziegler in San Fran. They wanted to see if they could improve people's attention spans by daily meditation. And they just used a simple app to improve memory and attention. After six weeks, they saw that the adults that used the app with the guided meditation performed better on tasks aimed at testing their attention and memory as opposed to the control group. And they used a participant's memory and attention across a range of tasks. Then they tracked EEG wave patterns of their brain while they were doing it. So overall, those people who had undergone the meditation training reduced the variation in their reaction time by 8 milliseconds. So there were 8 milliseconds faster. And if you're an Olympic athlete or somebody that has timed board exams like us, we know 8 milliseconds counts for a lot. That could be a difference between a passing and a failing score, indicating they were less distracted compared to the control group. Biggest improvement in the meditation group were the ones who focused on their breath. Basically, they saw that they had improved attention. And that eight milliseconds, it might not sound like a lot to the listeners, but is this per task? So if you're thinking about, even for a single exam question, you might have multiple things that you're doing, whether it be scratching out incorrect answers, highlighting key points in the question stem, deciding back and forth between this answer, that answer that are very similar. So you actually have multiple different tasks that you're working on within that question. So is this maybe potentially eight milliseconds per each of those, let alone per the hundreds of questions you have to go over? I cannot confirm the exact method that they did it, but task I would assume means like for them, if I remember correctly, what they did was it was more of like a hand-eye coordination. So that comes in very handy with questions, like you said, highlighting and eliminating questions. So they had like a square on the screen and they were supposed to eliminate something based on color. So it was attention span and reaction time as well, which factor into efficiently getting through your blocks within an hour of whatever amount of questions you have, like 46, 50. 
for us. A minute per question, right? <laughs> yeah, about, yep. All right. So that sounds still pretty useful. And I mean, especially if you think about throughout the entire day, how much time this is saving you, let alone throughout the whole week, you get to the end of the week, you're like, well, I just spent 10 hours a day studying and I feel like I don't have any more time. Well, you might have received a few extra minutes or hours throughout that week if you were just a little bit more efficient at each task you were working on. That's really, really good point. The meditation group in this test group also appeared to have more consistent activity in the brain regions associated with attention while performing the trials. So in order to take advantage of this in the age of COVID-19 and coronavirus, unfortunately, healthcare personnel are on the front lines. There's two apps, Headspace as well as 10% Happier, which is giving, I believe, six months of free membership to healthcare personnel. So go ahead and sign up for you to be able to take advantage of this. Nothing better than free and get your meditation in to see, you know, your attention and your memory actually improve. Wow, that's great. I've used both of those in the past, but only they're free material. So I didn't know they were offering six months free right now. I'm going to have to go check those out. So besides the meditation aspect, there are many other things that we need to focus on as sort of a, a daily regimen to keep healthy in general. What's another one that we should focus on? You know, that's a really good question. And I always love to talk to my patients about this, as well as uh, the people that I work with on the residency success platform. I ask them, so Chase, if you had a Ferrari and I gave you a gas car that was, has unlimited gas, when you go to the gas station, would you put unleaded, regular, or premium gas into your Ferrari in order for it to be the machine that you want it to be daily? Um, I don't know what it's supposed to take. <laughs> I would assume that's one of those that needs a premium, maybe? Yeah, yeah. So premium is likened to what I'm trying to get at is what you're putting in your body. The premium fuel is going to keep going every day, right? A lot of times because of stress eating and while we're studying, we're unfortunately eating chips and, you know, ordering pizza and eating ice cream to keep ourselves going. And everyone's gained those 10 to 15 pounds while studying just because you are sitting for so long. But it's not so much about vanity as it is really about getting the optimal nutrition. So as we know, the brain is mostly fat, getting components like omega-3 fatty acids, B vitamins, antioxidants, these are all known to support brain health and referred to as brain foods, right? And incorporating these into our diet, research shows these are the same brain foods that protect your heart and blood vessels. So why? Because we want the optimal flow to your heart, which is what pumps to the brain, right? Because if heart attack and strokes are all because of inflammation, as well as we know, not having good vessels or pliable vessels free of inflammation. So in order to get less inflammation in the body, green leafy vegetables, right? Kale, spinach, broccoli, collard greens. We have nutrients like vitamin K, lutein, folate, beta carotene. And research shows that these plant-based foods may help slow cognitive decline later in life as well. Fatty fish, right? We keep hearing about omega-3, omega-6 fatty acids. We need a good balance, like a two-to-one ratio. Basically, these healthy, unsaturated fats have been linked to lower the levels of beta amyloid. These are the protein that forms the damaging clumps in the brains of people with Alzheimer's disease. So try to eat fish at least twice a week for vegetarians. There's a lot of other options for you to take evening primrose oil, eat avocados, eat walnuts. There's flaxseed as well. So there are a lot of options for you that are lower in mercury than fish as well. I was yep. going to ask that next because as someone that sticks to a pretty much plant-based diet, the fish being mostly cut out of there, what are the alternatives? So I'm glad to see that there are some. Avocado is definitely something I have very regularly and flaxseed in my morning shake every day. So <laughs> good to see there are options for every lifestyle or dietary need. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we have talked also about being plant-based, eating the rainbow, right? So the reason they say that is because all of the phytocyanins and the brightly colored fruit and vegetables, mainly berries, they have flavonoids. They're the natural plant pigments that give the berries their brilliant hues. It helps improve your memory, research shows. There was an article in 2012 in the Annals of Neurology Research at Harvard 
hospitals showed that women who consumed two or more servings of strawberries and blueberries each week delayed memory decline up to two and a half years. Blue and purple foods are the ultimate brain food. So they obviously like blueberries. And I don't know if you've ever tried purple potatoes, but they are so beautiful and they're also delicious. And that purple pigment is going to help you uh, with memory decline. And also studies show that you have improvements in word recall as well as depressive symptoms if you drink wild blueberry juice for 12 weeks. So basically, I swear by it in terms of just something to help you feel light, enhance memory and cognition, and also helps lower your blood pressure. Additionally, things like prunes, figs, eggplants, raisins, purple potatoes, we just talked about that, plums, blackberries, purple and black grapes, another excuse to have red wine, right? Have anti-aging properties and promote longevity. Like that excuse. (laughs) (laughs) And all of these things, you know, we talked about them for heart health, but obviously whatever promotes heart health is going to promote brain health as well, because we are really talking about vascular benefits where we keep our vessels fluid, keep them from hardening over time. And, you know, just uh, find a way to sneak these things into your foods. Like you said, smoothies. Anytime I make rice, I can, I usually throw in nuts and certain different vegetables. If you bake, you can always sneak in vegetables into those as well. So another one that we always use anyway while we're studying is tea and coffee. It's not just a short-term concentration boost. They showed that caffeine consumption helped people score better on tests of mental function. It helps to solidify memories as well. But usually I tell you people, keep yourself to two cups a day and cut yourself off at 4 p.m. so you don't have disturbances in your sleep-wake cycle. And if you are going to drink caffeine, make sure you are drinking water as well, right? Anything you're doing requires you that you hydrate well. The brain is also fat and it's also water. So it needs to be kept hydrated if you're going to be exercising that muscle daily. And in case you haven't heard, our tickets for the Online Medical Education Summit are now live. So go to freemeded.org slash O-M-E-S for your free ticket. Join our physician speakers, education experts, and medical advisors giving you the tips you need to survive medical school. Plus, join the best medical education content creators at their booths, ask them questions, and maybe even receive discounts. And in the spirit of Free Med Ed, this event is free. So get your free ticket for our May 30th event now at freemeded.org slash O-M-E-S for the Online Medical Education Summit. We hope to see you there. It sounds like we've covered meditation and there's been a lot of theory about meditation for decades. Now we're finally starting to get a lot more strong evidence towards the benefits of it focusing on attention for longer periods of time. So it's really helping your endurance as well. And then we have the health benefits of, well, anything that affects the blood vessels, which is pretty much anything we put in our body, is going to affect the brain because it needs a lot of those nutrients from the blood vessels. There are options for anyone out there. There are options for plant-based diet, individuals such as myself. And then with our daily intake of, of caffeine, I know personally I'm pretty sensitive to coffee. I will get jittery pretty quickly and uh, I need to stick mostly to the caffeine in tea, which I heard is is more than coffee, but it's more balanced, something along those lines. There's less of a peak. But <laughs> utilizing all these things that we probably already do to some degree or another, just sort of changing them around, adding more color, which makes sense because where are they getting the color? They're going through different chemical reactions and having different substrates, different byproducts. So having more of those ourselves gives the body more to work with, more materials, more fuel. Absolutely. And, you know, there is a couple of students that I worked with where I just changed around their daily habits. You know, they were just not eating right. They were not taking the proper nutrients. We added some supplements and then just checking in with me over the course of a few weeks basically helped them start feeling better so they could actually focus. So on top of meditation and food, which is something that we all have to do several times a day, There are a few other topics that you also mentioned being vital for cognitive health. What are those? What we should also really talk about is exercise and neuroplasticity. Everybody loves to talk about exercise, but we don't really talk about what the actual benefits are in the body sometimes. We know exercise is good for you. You know, anytime you exercise, you feel good. But why is that? 
when you do physical exercise, you increase something called brain-derived neurotropic factor. It's called BDNF. It's a protein in the brain that promotes growth and maintenance of neurons. Who would not want that, right? I want more. (laughs) (laughs) You know, anytime you give plants plant food, that's sort of like what BDNF does for you. It's secreted when you exercise. And there was a researcher called Baker conducted a randomized trial comparing both high intensity aerobic exercise and stretching to stretching alone over six months. These results showed sex-specific effects of aerobic exercise on cognition, glucose metabolism, and the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal access. He also looked at the comparable improvements in cardiorespiratory fitness and body fat reduction, right? So there's a win-win situation here. Interestingly, the different results were observed in women and men. For example, for women, aerobic exercise changed their enhanced performance on multiple tests. Their results showed improved executive function while increasing glucose disposal during the metabolic clamp and reducing plasma fasting levels of insulin, cortisol, which we know is a stress hormone, and BDNF. For men, aerobic exercise increased plasma levels of insulin-like growth factor one, but only had a favorable effect on a single measure of performance. Now, don't ask me to explain exactly why. Obviously, we have hormonal differences, women and, and men. But what I can say is that the benefits are far reaching than obviously all what just one study can show. We know at the local level, your muscles just are releasing a lot of substances that promote well-being. They're growing for 24 hours after exercise. Your sleep, your stress, and your cortisol level being decreased is what's going to help you perform better the next day. That's really interesting. I feel like I've heard something along the lines of that before where more aerobic activities showed more benefits in those studies for women and more strength training activities seem to show more benefits for men or something along those lines, but don't quote me because I don't remember the details of it. And uh, I I do like that you mentioned that it takes 24, maybe even a little longer for some type of muscle development because that's a good reason to stop exercising and mentally and physically a day or two before your exam so that you're not still putting metabolic activity and energy into building really when you want to be focusing just on that exam work? Whatever you do should be tried and tested. We train almost like athletes, right? But it's like a mental endurance and you really want to get into the groove where you wake up, your day is pretty much the same as when you're going to walk into that test center at least a month or two before you walk in. So it's like just any other day. Yep. Habits are a great way to reduce stress on exam day for sure. And do we have another topic to discuss for brain health? Yes, I would like to talk a little bit about just your light exposure during the day and then at night, right? And then go sort of into sleep a little bit. If you live in an otherwise low light area of the world, just keep in mind that light exposure has a large influence on the chemical balance involved in sleep maintenance. So exposure to light during the day, during our waking hours, is critical to maintaining adequate secretion of melatonin. We know that's what's secreted to help us basically sleep. It's also a hormone that helps to kind of balance all the other hormones in the HPA access. But the systematic secretion of neurochemicals like melatonin, it's a regulatory process for brain chemicals to follow in maintaining your sleep patterns. So if you tend to get depressed during rainy or darker seasons, I recommend using a small light therapy device. I have one I use for a few hours to boost my alertness during the day. That might be very useful for someone in let's say Seattle or Portland, where there's a lot of clouds and you don't get to see the sun all that often. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the other thing that I was talking about is sleep. Memory consolidation occurs in sleep. And that's basically what you need basically to be well rested. Pulling all nighters is not going to help you consolidate those memories, especially right before the exam. So what the right amount is for everyone differs. I've personally always been a person who needs more sleep. And according to my fellowship director, who's also sleep medicine boarded, it's called long sleeper syndrome. So then uh, when I told somebody this, they said, ah, you're just justifying sleep. (laughs) (laughs) It's a a good excuse to use if you need it. (laughs) You know, basically that you need to sleep. Now, sleep hygiene, let's talk about that a little bit. 
this blue light that emits from our smartphones, our devices, as well as laptops, iPads should be minimized or basically shut off at least two hours prior to bedtime. I tell all of my patients that. And a lot of people use melatonin, but they use it incorrectly. Melatonin is the vitamin that people use, start off at five or 10 milligrams, but they take it at night. It's not to be taken as a sleep aid. It's supposed to mimic the natural circadian rhythm that everybody is normally secreting, which will start when the sun goes down. So you should be taking it with dinner or as it first starts getting dark so that you can get sleepy at the right time. So I guarantee you, if you're taking it correctly, it's going to work correctly for you now. Oh. A lot of people come back and say, Doc, I took melatonin. It doesn't do anything. I was like, well, when are you taking it? So then we figure out exactly what they're doing wrong at that time. The dosing. I didn't realize that. That's good to know. I haven't used that supplement since I was probably in middle school and I've always had trouble sleeping. So at the time, my mom had me using that. But yeah, I didn't notice the effect and I don't remember now if I was using it before bed or something like that, very likely. Good to know there's a common issue there to look out for, whether you're taking it yourself or your future patients are too. That's right. For any memory, the common memory, you need three functions to occur, right? Something called acquisition, you learn or experience something new. That's during your waking hours. Then consolidation, the memory becomes stable in the brain. Then you have recall, having the ability to access the memory in the future. So both acquisition and recall are functions that take place when you're awake. But researchers believe sleep is required for the consolidation of the memory, no matter what the memory type. So without adequate sleep, your brain has a harder time absorbing and recalling the need. Subjectively, I would completely agree. If I don't get adequate sleep, the next day, I can't remember anything that happened the, the previous day. If I have like a, a horrible night, something happens, only get three, four hours of sleep, I'm not going to remember that previous day at all. <laughs> just all wasted. Right. Just to touch upon one of my favorite things, which is my research baby, is lymphatics, which is a lymphatic system that's been shown in the brain to be active when you're sleeping. It actually retrieves and repairs and clears out the junk the same way that the lymph nodes do in the body. But we won't get too much into that. But I did want to share a new study that literally just came out in the beginning of March by Tel Aviv University. They tried to look at the processing of uh, brain during sleep, especially with memory evoking scents. So what they did was they gave like a rose perfume to patients when they were exposed to a particular experience or a memory while they were awake. But what they did see that they wanted to see if they could do this sleep aid and in the future possibly help restore memory capabilities following brain injury or people with PTSD or whom memory serves as a trigger for bad memories, let's say. So the researcher began from the knowledge that memories associated with locations on the left side of a person are mostly stored in the right hemisphere and vice versa. So while being exposed to the scent of the rose, Research participants were asked to remember the location of words presented on either the left or right side of a computer screen. So participants were then tested on their memory of the word locations. So they said either where it was, whether it was left or right, and then they proceeded to nap at the lab. And when they were napping, the scent of roses was administered, but this time only to one side of the nostril, so either left or right. So with this one-sided odor delivery, the researchers were able to reactivate and boost specific memories that were stored in a specific brain hemisphere. And this was recorded by an EEG. It showed basically that the one-sided rose scent delivery led to different sleep waves in the two hemispheres. And the hemisphere that received the scent revealed better electrical signatures of memory consolidation during sleep. Finally, yeah, the most hmm. crucial test of all, the subjects were then asked after waking up to undergo a second memory test about the words they had been exposed to before falling asleep. The memory of the subjects was significantly better for words presented on the side affected by the smell than for the memory for words presented on the other side. So basically, they concluded that memory consolidation process can be amplified by external cues such as scents. So for all of you that have those Amazon scent diffusers, this is a great news. <laughs> I was going to say, so aromatherapy at night will boost our memory? <laughs> yeah, well, I guess what they're saying is that 
this scent is helping, acting as a cue to retrieve and help consolidation. So they've often said rosemary essential oil also has certain properties that are similar to this. They used rose here. But I think having a nice scent going and then maybe a nice scent going when you're sleeping couldn't hurt. Maybe it'll help our memory consolidation because research supports it. It's worth a try. Yeah. Yes, definitely. And one last question when it comes to sleep and memory There are a lot of quote-unquote sleep hacks out there and people swear by them, these efficiency gurus and and other popular individuals, maybe on YouTube or on their own podcast. What would you say to some of these sleep hacks? I love that it's sort of like a millennium thing to hack everything, but maybe when you call it hacking, someone will actually click on it as opposed to saying sleep tactics or better sleep hygiene, because that sounds too nerdy, right? So... Let's say if you just try one sleep hack, make it this one. The junk light, I talked about this or alluded to it earlier, the blue light that emits from your smartphone, laptop, and tablet screens is wrecking your sleep. I recommend that all my patients use no smartphones two hours before bed because what happens is the blue light actually goes in to your brain, you know, through your eyes, and it messes with your brain's production of melatonin the hormone that tells your body when it's time to snooze. The blue light wakes you up and tells your brain that that's daytime. The screens are not the only sort of junk light, right? They're street lamps, LED light bulbs. So the best way is to protect yourself from too much blue light exposure. Use blackout curtains, unplug unnecessary electronics in your bedroom, wear blue light blocking glasses, shut down electronic devices, increase the warm light setting on your phone. There's So there's on all iPhones or smart devices, there is like a nighttime mode that you can program that goes on like at eight or seven, whenever you're ready to start winding down. And I've found that people get more restful sleep even by just doing these small sort of sleep hacks. Good to know. I do that on my phone, my tablet, but the TV, there's no way to do that with. And I don't know how the light on my Kindle is actually if I'm reading before bed on on that. So I'll have to look into that. Yeah. So before we get into the the closing questions here, I did want to ask you a little bit more about what residency success is and how could maybe this audience in the near future use your services to benefit their applications and, and other aspects of the confusing match system. Yeah, that's uh, we're in match week currently and also in the midst of the coronavirus epidemic or pandemic. And it's a crazy time out there. And if there's one thing, if I could go back in time um, and tell people or change about myself, there's a lot of shame in medicine when you do not hit your milestones of a test or a life goal. So I feel we have to shatter them by talking about them like we do like in these platforms and getting personalized assistance from a coach who's better able to guide us. You know, what I say is that I set up residency success because of the fact that there are a lot of misnomers, miscommunication, erroneous things that get transferred between people just as rumors about the process or what they will ask in interviews. And they basically memorize for interviews the way they're memorizing for tests. And no, 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 no. That is the absolute incorrect way to go about it. The reason I work with people is what I do is I sum them up, I look at all their materials, and I really gauge their personality. I use my undergraduate psych degree sort of skills to bring out the best version of themselves so that they can excel and really, really show the interviewer who they are in those 10, 15 minutes. Because don't mistake it, you are selling yourself. Having a pre-recorded or pre-rehearsed answer that you talked with with a whole bunch of chain of medical students just going to bore them to death and you're not going to stand out. Got it. And that actually segued to the the next question was going to be one thing you could change in time. What would it be? So you sort of already covered that one. Great. Right. Are there a few resources, yours and outside, that you would recommend to those maybe advancing to the residency stage and looking for guidance? You know, that's a really good question. I really like the simpler things in life. I know there's a lot of fancy apps and a lot of fancy things out there to help you stay organized. I like Google Reminders and I like Google Calendar because it goes from my computer to my phone. It sort of like syncs with whatever email address I have logged in with. Because if it's not on my calendar and if it's not as a reminder, it's not going to happen. 
basically, right? How many times do you wake up in the morning, you think you have this to do, but you realize that there's a whole bunch of other things on your calendar. So what I do is before bed, I take stock of my day and I assign a label of A or B to the most important things I want to accomplish the next day. So A gets done first and B gets done second and whatever else is left on the list that can move to the next day or be done at a later time kind of goes over to the next day. And we move them to a master list. So after you wake up, you know what you must accomplish already because you did it the night before. And I highly recommend before you start studying or embarking on any kind of journey of studying or these residency applications or even interviews, take a stock of your mental and physical health, right? Get a full physical, address anxiety and depression issues, get a full checkup of thyroid and get like a basic physical done and regular blood tests, start lowering your BMI and start small like actionable goals towards getting healthier like 30 minutes of exercise a day plus 15 minutes of strength training or whatever it is that you can, you can manage. So be healthy. <laughs> yeah. Where can the audience find out more about you and your services? Uh, thank you. I actually have a page on Facebook called Residency Success, MD to attending, or if you just put in Residency Success, it comes up on the Facebook page. My email is very, very easy to remember. It's residencysuccess2000 at gmail.com. And my direct number is 917-524-8067. I would like nothing more for you to just join the group and someone that's part of the community. And in the time that you may need more personalized help or assistance, you know where to find me. Sounds good. And we will add those to the show notes as well. Well, Dr. Shay Dada, thank you so much for coming on the show today. No problem. And thank you so much for having me. 